folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm going to ask you a question. What would it be like if you actually traveled back in time 30 years from now, which is 1985, the year that this film had came out on July 3rd, and it became a huge box office success during the summer? Well, here's the movie that gives you your answer. It's Back to the Future. Yes, that's right. This is, of course, the trilogy collection that I got on Blu-ray that just came out in 2010, celebrated its 25th anniversary at the time, but it's now celebrated its 30th anniversary since this movie came out, which is the first movie, by the way. And... Of course, this is the one that I got just recently at Target for only $39.99. Yeah, pretty expensive, but that's pretty much the original cost. And it came with a slipcover like this. And this is, of course, the, the repackaged version from 2011 because the original 2010 release came with a digital copy, which is like, which basically they stacked two discs together on one of these weird packaging that a lot of people had trouble taking the disc out. They even had instructions to put it in so that way people could find a better way to to take the disc out even though it wasn't really easy. But this is what it looks like all together. Yep. All three of them. That's all free disc. No digital copies included, and it's a lot easier to take the disc out. Yeah, <laughs> so that's perfect. And it even has all the movie covers as well. So this is like one awesome set. This isn't the only set that I own, by the way, but it was great to own it because I like to see this film in HD, and it has new extras that was never on any DVD release whatsoever. So it's really cool. So not only do I own that, but I also own this DVD from 2009. The main reason to get this, which is a two disc set of course, is to have all the special features on the back. And I like the fact that they had the movie poster that came out when the movie was in theaters. And I know they used that on DVD. And every other. It has a slip cover that's shiny. This is where it has just a two disc set right here. Just one disc that's in black. And another black disc too. This is where they have the bonus features. The movie itself. Same here. And of course, who can forget? The 2002 set, that's uh, very shiny and it's in blue. And of course this was also a repackaged version too because I know originally when this came out, the sequels that came with it were actually cropped since this is the widescreen edition that I own. But they fixed that problem a year later in 2003. This is what it looks like and when you open it, you get all the disc right here. <laughs> That's just the artwork that you have. And, yep, here you go. If you see the V2 on the bottom, that's where they fixed the problem. So, yes, you could tell that this is definitely the re release version of the same set. So, I'm glad I own this because it was the main reason why I love this movie so much. Because I used to own this on VHS too. When I bought it at McDonald's back in 1994. But I sold it off because I had to buy the entire set like this. And <laughs> you just never get tired of this movie. It, this movie, you know, was always as memorable as it ever has been. Had a lot of funny dialogue that you never 
stop quoting like such as uh, oh this is heavy or great Scott or even slacker yeah and it had a lot of memorable moments that you saw in the movie had an awesome soundtrack yeah, Huey Lewis and the news you know such as uh, the power of love and back in time he also made a cameo appearance in the movie as well yeah, on that one particular memorable scene and of course who couldn't forget that wonderful score that was done by Alan Silvestri yep the clock tower theme that they've been using throughout the movie especially during the end of the film when he was going to go back in time once they try to fix the clock tower and everything yeah trying to get all the clock tower set up while a huge lightning storm had happened yeah so <laughs> just never gets old, never gets tired. You would watch this movie over and over again. All done by producer Steven Spielberg and director Robert Zemeckis, who is also the co-writer of the film along with his buddy Bob Gale. So what they give us is a timeless classic. That's all it is. You just never get tired of it. The movie became so popular that it started to spawn off an animated series, a theme park attraction, which is the Back to the Future, the ride. I actually been there at Universal Studios Hollywood back in the 90s, and it was fun. Having to ride the DeLorean that they used from the movie, and you had to fly around, move around, and you had to see all these footages that they had into the film, trying to chase uh, Biff all the way around because he stole the, the DeLorean and trying to go after him because of that yeah that was really fun um, I never forget that ride I'm just glad that it's on the DVD and Blu-ray editions from 2009 and 2010 so this is the only way you can see the ride for yourself yeah <laughs> on home video releases of the film which is only on VHS and I think they put it on lasers as well they actually did put in the to be continue tag at the end of the film because they were going to follow with the trilogy so they knew it was going to be they were going to follow to the second and then later the third so yeah but it's never on the DVDs and Blu-ray releases at all and I know it, it's sad that they didn't put that but luckily they did put it on one of the special features though so at least we got to see that intact so maybe that was the only way we could find it so now we're going to get to the movie that that became one of the highest successful films of all time Back to the Future which stars Michael J. Fox from Family Ties Christopher Lloyd from Taxi Leah Thompson from Red Dawn, Crispin Glover, Thomas Elf Wilson, Claudia Wells, James Tolkien, Warren McClure from the Superman movies, and Winnie Joe Sperber from the TV show Booze and Buddies with Tom Hanks. It's written and directed by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. And it's directed by Robert Zemeckis. So let's get right to it. The movie began set inside scientist Dr. Emmett Brown, who's played by Christopher Lloyd, had once up going out with his dog Einstein to do some of his latest experiments. So the whole house was empty that's filled with clocks hanging around, you know, moving forward yeah, and not to mention uh, the TV was on the, the dog can opener actually moves around you know putting inside uh, Einstein's dog food on, on his dish so on and so forth and then suddenly a teenager named Marty McFly who's played by Michael J. Fox who came in just to see if Doc is here yeah, he's already made a phone call to him about this, and then 
you know, just after he tried out the the audio system that Doc has, including that huge speaker, he turned it up under overload, and and by the by the use of that one silver pick that he has, just to try out that small guitar just for a test, <laughs> he blew the entire system. It blew him all the way back, and then suddenly <laughs> the speaker actually blew. Yeah, that that was a funny scene, and then and it was really loud too when when we saw that scene. So then he found out that he was late for class, so he had to be on his way. And once he got out of the garage, you know, he was already you know using a skateboard and trying to ride around in, by holding on on the back of the truck that's going by just so he can get to Hill Valley as soon as possible. And in that background that you just saw. You can see uh, Burger King on the side, along with uh, Toys R Us, Olay's uh, Home Centers, and you, even on the back corner you can even see Lancer's Restaurant and the First Interstate Bank Building, as well as Terry's Lumber and all the rest. That location, as we speak, is the same location that I actually go to, because right next to it is Inclusion Films. That's right. Same particular location in North Victory Boulevard in Burbank, California. Yeah, and things have changed since then because Burger King has already had a new look since the 90s. And, and once again, we still had Toys R Us with already had a new look too. You know, we used to have an Orchard Supply Hardware, which, you know, after Olay's, it was Builder's Emporium. It's now a Hobby Lobby. A new art supply store. Yeah, we now have um, you know, First Interstate Bank has already become Wells Fargo, but but the one in Burbank is simply you know, first it was PC Computers, and then next it was New Star. And Lancers is still around; already had a new look at this point, and yep. And Terry Lumber had became Stock Lumber. And the other building that's right next to it is now the Ari building. That's where they have all these uh, equipments, including cameras, you know, film cameras and everything. And on the other side, there was the foam mart. So, yeah, things have changed. It's pretty much the same, but it just gives it a whole different experience. Yeah. Anyway, well, once he went inside the uh, Hill Valley... You know, he finally meets his girlfriend, Jennifer Parker, who's played by Claudia Wells. Uh, and once they try to get inside uh, the high school yeah, in Hill Valley, he meets a principal named Mr. Strickland, who's played by James Tolkien. He actually calls uh, Marty a slacker. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that he mentions about his father, you know, was a slacker, too. Wait, when he finally... Uh, uh, started to do his uh, presentation with his uh, rock band and then you actually see all the judges on the side yeah one of them is actually played by Huey Lewis himself already in disguise with the, the glasses and everything so he makes a cameo appearance in the movie yeah and once he was actually playing that uh, that beat that was actually from Huey Lewis' song The Power of Love yeah, you can actually hear a guitar or instrumental music that they put in unfortunately <laughs> yeah Huey Lewis wants up um, picking up his megaphone and starts saying I'm afraid that you're too loud and next so yeah <laughs> he didn't get it but then after that you know Jennifer wrote down her phone number so he can give her a call you know, so maybe they can hang out and do something over the weekend. But then when he finally arrived back at home, he, he began to find out that they went into a huge accident. Yeah, which um, his father, uh, George McFly, who's played by Crispin Glover, is being bullied by his supervisor, who happens to be the bully as we know, Biff Tannen, who's played by Thomas Elf Wilson. Yeah. Yeah, they, they got into a fight, and and, they, and George had to cover all the damages that, that happened. Yeah, because that was the car that uh, Marty was going to choose. Uh, later on, uh, well, during the dinner time, 
You know, his mother Lorraine, who's now overweight and alcoholic, was played by Leah Thompson, who actually remembers what happened in the past, uh, along with their uncle and brother named Dave McFly and, and sister Linda, you know, both played by Mark McCurr and Randy Joe Sperber. So, you know, they're just making a conversation while, while George is just watching the show and everything. But what was it like when they were in high school? So that's when uh, Marty finally meets uh, Doc Brown, you know, who's actually a, his best friend and everything, late at night in the parking lot of a shopping mall that's what's actually called Twin Pines Mall, where Doc actually unreveals, as we speak, a time machine that was built by a DeLorean. And, <laughs> yep, and it was modified, filled with a lot of gadgets that's put inside. And, yep, it has everything that they went into. So, of course, not only does this vehicle has all the the timelines and all this stuff, but it even has a flux capacitor, which is powered by the plutonium that they use, that he actually stolen by the Libyan terrorists. Yeah, it's a terrorist group, which actually was about to go after uh, Doc Brown because of it. So anyway, he decided to do the test uh, with Marty by using the DeLorean, by using Einstein as his as the time traveler and this is where he actually says this line once he was using that remote control that sexy moves the DeLorean he actually says when this baby hits 88 miles per hour you're gonna see some serious shit <laughs> and this is why he does it when, when he speeds up the up to 88 miles per hour it actually shoots all the way through and it moves around and explodes right on the side and then the car disappears, and then it, a, a line of um, a flame started to shoot up right near uh, Doc and Marty. <laughs> and then you can even see the license plate that says "Out of Time." <laughs> yeah, he was, <laughs> and it was a huge success. And then, and then when it finally came back, they began to find out that the DeLorean that's all frozen solid. And a lot of ice that's that's all the way around and he opens and <laughs> Einstein's still there and while well, he was wearing that collar that has all the time uh, clocks in there and then also by demonstrating the time circuits he he enters the example date of November 5th 1955 which is the day that he invented the flux capacitor but before Doc can make his trip, suddenly the Librians had appeared inside the band and actually gunned them down. And then suddenly Marty wants up uh, being chased by them by going back inside the DeLorean and try to race in, in order to get away with them. And and once he <laughs> he went up to 90 miles per hour, that's when he finally uh, went straight into the photo booth, which is Fox Photo. And it then it suddenly uh, travels way back in time to to what the what the mall used to be, and now it's uh, simply a barn. And he drive all the way right straight to it. Yeah. And that's when he found out that yep, he traveled back in time to November 6, 1955. I mean, he thought it was a dream at first when he went inside. And then he wanders around inside Hill Valley, already that seems like a desert now, in 1955. And then he runs up inside the place where he actually remembers, and everything had changed since then. All has that 50s vibe into it. All You can see the classic Texaco gas station. You can see all these other places, even the movie theaters, and everything, even the clock tower has stayed intact. You know, and all that. Even that cafe that they had, too. So everything was just... It's like brand new again, compared to what it looked in, in 85. So then when he went inside the cafe, just to call to see if... 
if Doc Emmer Brown is still around, um, somewhere in Riverside Drive, he winds up encountering a teenage version of George McFly, who's already being bullied by his fellow classmates, Biff Tannen, along with his friends. And then all of a sudden, he ran and actually found George McFly on top of the tree, you know, becoming a peepy -pee Tom by using his uh, binoculars. And suddenly he fell and he almost got run over by a car. Yeah, which, uh, which Marty actually saves his life. But he got run over, and it turns out that the father that he ran over him was actually, as we speak, Lorraine's uh, dad. Yeah, he was already been knocked out um, in bed for hours, and then, yeah, we know that line. And, and then suddenly we spotted Lorraine, that's now <laughs> very young and thin, and he even calls uh, <laughs> Marty McFly Calvin Klein. Because because of the purple underwear he was wearing, <laughs> it, it it was a funny scene too, and and then when he finally went inside the family room, and while well, his father was already setting up the a new TV set, because they were about to watch uh, the honeymooners, yeah, you know, we get to meet uh, Lorraine's family, her mother along with um, her brothers and so on. Yeah, he even spotted uh, Jason Hervey, you know, in the movie. You know, the guy who went on to do the TV series, uh, The Wonder Years. So, yeah, he was actually talking to uh, to him about what they were watching and about that one episode that he remembers. Yeah, and he said he saw this in a rerun and everything. And then, But, of course, Lorraine was already, you know, flirting with Marty. You know, he was about to... <laughs> Have him stay at his room, but then you know he had to leave so that, that way he can get to uh, to Doc Brown's house. And when he finally meets him, that's when we find out that Doc is already you know trying out that experiment since he already you know as we speak because he mentions to Doc that he actually knocked himself unconscious in the bathroom into the toilet because that's where suddenly his memory starts to change and that's when he's, he's discovered that he's now becoming as we speak. A scientist so yeah <laughs> and I remember that scene because then he found out that yeah uh, that of course Marty is from the future and and he was trying to explain about all the stuff that that he was doing once uh, he, he got back here and he was telling them and this is that funny scene was when he told uh, <laughs> when he told uh, Doc about okay Okay, future boy, who's the president in 1985? And Marty actually says, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and Doc just says, the actor? <laughs> and who's vice president, Jerry Lewis? <laughs> and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, that, that was a funny joke. Bringing Doc around just to find the, the DeLorean that's already been, where all the plutonium was already emptied and, and it couldn't move because yeah, it stopped uh, during the beginning of the movie when Marty was already running as fast as he can so he, so he left all of his other equipment that he has. That's where uh, Doc actually shows the, the drawing of the flux capacitor which is actually inside the, <laughs> the DeLorean. So then they, they he finally uses the um, his uh, camera that he has, the camcorder, to actually show it an actual footage of what was it like in 1985 when we got to see Doc Brown the way he was, and he was talking about the 1.21 gigawatts, although he did say gigawatts, <laughs> which it, it finds out that the only way to get back to 1985 is a bolt of lightning. Which, that's where we actually saw the uh, the ad that he had, where we saw the clock tower. So that's where we know what actually happened at the time in 1955, where, you know, during the, at the same time as the, the achievement of the Blue Sea Dance um, in high school, where that a huge lighting strike would appear into the town's courthouse, which is coming on Saturday night. So Doc actually forms a plan to harness the power of lightning while Marty sets to introduce his parents 
to each other's uh, in his own existence because that's where we saw the scene where he shows a picture of him along with his brother and, and sister already disappearing at this point yeah so anyway when Lorraine asks uh, Marty to come to the upcoming school dance Marty actually has plans to have George attend as well so he can rescue Lorraine you know from all the inappropriate advances but that's when it gets even worse when Biff Tannen goes around trying to go after Lorraine to the dance with her. So Marty comes around to save both George and Lorraine. Because he's the bravest of them all. He can actually beat the shit out of Biff um, along with his gang. So, <laughs> which that's where we lead to that scene in the movie when they went into the cafe. You know, just so he can get George to, to talk to Lorraine. Until Biff started to show up and... <laughs> And Marty actually um, slipped them, and then and then he punches him in the face, you know, knocked him out cold, and and knocked out all of his friends. And I know one of the friends that Biff has, of course, were played by Casey Samesco and uh, Billy Zane. And they actually chased Marty around while he he actually borrowed the the kids, uh, which turned out to be a skateboard now, <laughs> and he tried to escape from these guys and. Yeah, you know, they're chasing him all the way around, and and once, uh, you know, once he went on top of uh, of the car that he, you know he was going to run over him, and he ran around and went into the skateboard. Suddenly, Biff and his friends drove all the way straight into the maneuver, <laughs> and they're all covered with it. So yeah, it, it was all. <laughs> so, so yeah, <laughs> they got what they deserve. So then at the end, you know, Doc was still doing their testing on, on how they had to use the, the DeLorean to go straight into all the wires, which is going to be hooked up. So all the way straight to the tower. So once the bolt of lightning hits, that's when it, it's going to go straight to it. And then and the DeLorean is going to go straight into it and then it'll disappear. So perfect. You know, Marty was already having planned for... For George, because there was, this was that one funny scene in the movie. Was <laughs> I think this was before or after, but this was a scene um, where he was dressed up in that yellow suit, and I know he was actually putting in the headphones with uh, his uh, cassette player, and he was actually playing the song by Edward Van Halen, and then <laughs> he turned it on. And it was really loud. It actually almost blew his ears. And, and this is where he says that line, My name is Darth Vader. I'm from the planet Vulcan. In that sort of way. <laughs> I know there was that long scene in the film too that was extended in, in the deleted scenes and I thought that was hilarious. Oh yeah, that was a really funny scene. Uh, wow, there was a lot of that. Well anyway, so once... Uh, Marty was already dressed up for the dance <clears throat> by already writing down a letter to Doc because that way, you know, he'd be able to use it in case something goes wrong. Because, you know, that event that happened where, where the terrorists actually shot him down. And you know, just to let him know to actually bring something so he'll protect himself. Yeah, but he knew that this was going to happen later on. So anyway, he went back to the dance. He was already driving with Lorraine <laughs> he's already feeling very nervous about it because you know the fact that he was going to kiss her <laughs> or at this rate she was going to kiss him and they started drinking and smoking <laughs> and all that and then Biff started to arrive and because was, this was going to be part of an act that he was going to do with George so that way George can actually you know, pick Marty out of there and beat him up or something like that but it turns out it was Biff so Biff actually goes around to do that and Biff and his gang actually put uh, Marty inside the back trunk of the car which turned out to be the singers of the whole band <laughs> so then yeah they opened the the truck well already Biff is already you know inside his car with, with uh, Lorraine and when and when George finally arrived uh, that's when he spotted Biff and then he was ready to punch him but suddenly Biff actually hang on to his arm and already 
on yeah on one side of the arm, and then he got the other other side. He made a fist and punched his lights out all the way through into the back of the car, and then yeah he got knocked out cold. So yep, you know he finally saved Lorraine, and they finally went, made it into the dance. Which I know one kid actually started to pick out Lorraine, and that's when we found out that Marty was already starting to fade out. Since, you know, he, he was already, you know, fading once he, he tries to play that song on the guitar, you know, to the song Earth Angel. And then, when George finally uh, <laughs> uh, pushed him out of the side, and he finally went back to Lorraine, he kisses her, and and everything went back to its place, and then finally... Marty decided to do that. One famous scene that I really enjoy was when he actually played the song Johnny Be Good with the guitar and he was like walking all the way around <laughs> for the entire scene and I know they used another singer to sing this voice on it. Yeah, you can tell he was lip syncing. And then <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, that that was one of my favorite moments in the movie and then then, you know, he finally left so just so he can get back into um, the time machine so that way everything needs to be hooked up completely. But of course, you know, all the plugs, all these wires and plugs started to come right out because of the, the storm. Doc had to go all the way on top of the tower just to hook all the cables and everything up in its place. It gets even worse. Yeah, and once, you know, Marty started to start up the, the DeLorean. Yeah, he had trouble starting it up until he finally had a miracle. So they start up, all the cables are connected, and already with the lightning already shooting up, it it finally um, shot a, a bolt of electricity all the way through the wires and as it's connected, and then the DeLorean finally disappears. And then, yep, so everything was a huge success. So now he's back in 1985, which I know he, he set it to 10 minutes, it should have been 20. Then he spotted, the, once again, the Libyan terrorists inside the band just going after Doc. And that's where he actually sees himself along with Doc as they pulled out. And then he found Doc already laying down until he, until he found out that he was actually wearing a bulletproof dress all this time. And then he found the letter. So, he, so that means he, he actually did time travel 30 years from now. <laughs> after all this time, almost towards the end of the movie... Everything seems to change as they seem already, you know, George and and Lorraine are already looking as good as they are now than they were then. And <laughs> everybody looks a lot better now than they seem. So things actually changed for the better. And then when they when Marty went inside the garage, he actually spotted that one big black truck that yeah, the four by four that he wanted to have all this time. So he finally got his wish, and then <laughs> he was going to do a test drive with uh, with his girlfriend Jennifer. But then suddenly, uh, Doc finally arrived uh, with his DeLorean, only to find out about the future, which that's what it's going to lead to at the end of the movie, because that's where we're going to get to the sequels that follow. Yeah, and that's that one scene is when when he was about to use the Mister Fusion to put a lot of fuel and everything. They're about to arrive together to find out uh, what's going to happen to their kids uh, later in the future. And then, the, and this is the scene once they ride into the, when they try to go all the way, Doc actually says, Roads? Well, where we're going, we don't need roads. So, yep, that's where the DeLorean actually flies all the way. <laughs> and then the movie ends. It's without a doubt one of the best time-traveling films of the 80s and simply the best film of 1985. Only right up there with the time machine from 1960 which is based on the H.G. Wells novel. You know about what was it like to actually time travel to a time where your parents was actually very young. Yeah their teenage years and how they actually uh, had fun I mean, even though it was a whole lot different compared to what they were when they were adults. Yeah, because the idea of this was that uh, that Bob Gale actually looked up on, on his yearbook from his father about what it would be like 
if he has to get to meet his father uh, as a teenager. So that was the idea of this movie. And, and I know Robert Zemeckis originally wanted to add a refrigerator and that's set inside a nuclear site to be used as a time machine. Because they didn't use the DeLorean until later on. So I f he figured maybe this would be a good idea. So they suggested that. And I know originally uh, they were going to cast uh, Eric Stoltz to play um, Marty McFly because even though their first choice was indeed Michael J. Fox, they figured because Michael J. Fox was so busy doing the TV series Family Ties that he couldn't be able to be available to work on the movie. But that's where I think it was going to become a tough time because already uh, Bob Semeckis was already working on the movie uh, Romancing the Stone, which actually became a huge hit at the box office in 1984. So that was enough for it to actually make the movie Back to the Future. Like sometime, like probably around uh, during 84 or 85, I think, when they started filming it. I don't know. But it might have been early 1985. Uh, I'll look it up. But, so yeah, they figured that once Gary uh, David Goldberg, the producer of Family Ties, actually gave... Uh, Michael J. Fox, the script that Bob Gale and, and Robert Zemeckis have wrote. And yeah, I know Michael J. Fox loved the script, that he wanted to actually join in. The problem is, is the fact that, you know, the whole show was ahead of schedule. So he thought, after that, he, he, you know, once he starts filming that one um, episode of Family Ties, that during the, the whole day, that the next hour it'll be the entire... Um, film shoot of, of Back to the Future, so they're just going to keep on filming, you know, all the way and, you know, throughout the entire week or so, maybe even a month, and it took him a lot of time to do so, <laughs> but, he, yeah, I kind of remember how frustrating it was for him to do all these scenes, because you can even tell how tired he was once he did it, you know, he even had trouble using the, sh the shift gear on, on the DeLorean, because it actually almost hurt his knuckles, I, I watched the interviews on the film, especially on the, the Blu-ray and DVD about how they filmed this movie. It was really interesting. I, I love all the makeup that they used for for uh, Crispin Glover and Leah Thompson when they were, when they were adults and the fact that they, they put all that makeup all the way around. And, <laughs> I know, because I, I remember on that, that behind the scenes uh, where Leah Thompson actually talks about when, when he showed that makeup to her her mother, <laughs> her mother actually gasp. So <laughs> oh man, it, it was fun, and, and it was also good to see um, all the cast in this movie. Everybody was good in this film. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, Michael J. Fox was awesome as Marty McFly. Christopher Lloyd was was cool and very energetic as uh, Dr. Emmett Brown. And Crispin Glover, of course, was great uh, as uh, George McFly, along with Leah Thompson, who was very beautiful in the film, yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, and, of course, Thomas Elf Wilson was a badass as the villain and, and the bully. Yeah, he was a jerk, a, a jerk that you really love to hate, but <laughs> you know how he is. But he was great. Everybody was good in this movie, even James Tolkien as uh, Mr. Strickland. Yeah, the, the principal. Yeah, he, he was awesome. Definitely check out Back to the Future. You know, this movie has been played many times on TV. Um, I know HBO played this movie all the time when it came out. Um, and I know a lot of channels had always played this film no matter what. But I always collect the film. I had it on VHS, which I sold it off just to get the, the box set. Uh, the entire trilogy, which is cool. I later got the DVD for the first movie, just for the other extras that I didn't have. And then later, the 25th anniversary edition for the Blu-ray, so that way I get to see it in HD with new features that's not on any releases, so it's cool. I know there's going to be a 30th anniversary edition sometime later in October. I'm not so sure that how that's going to happen, but who knows. They'll probably add some new features. I don't think they're not going to use a new uh, transfer for HD because I know they had a DCP transfer for the film and it looked much better 
than any of the Blu-ray transfers that we have, but I guess it's okay. Because they put a little DNR and an engine enhancement on there. But that's alright. And I know they also also working on a new documentary for um, Back to the Future just to celebrate its 30th anniversary. So I think I'm definitely looking forward to that if I get a chance to see it. So I <laughs> know. Yeah, because I'm glad to see that, you know, you know, they're still around and they're still doing interviews for the film, you know. Already with Michael J. Fox in that condition that he has, you know, Parkinson disease. He already has a foundation called Team Fox, so he's supporting that for everybody who has Parkinson disease. You know, Leah Thompson is doing great. She had a TV show for a while back in the 90s called Caroline in the City, and I know she moved on to, to go on bigger and better things. She did some a lot of movies mostly. Chris McGlover did a lot of films later on too. I know he didn't return in, in the sequels, but that's okay because he went on to do other bigger and better things. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, of course, had done a lot of stuff after this movie and, and the trilogy itself. The sequels, yeah, he did all these other films like The Addams Family. Yeah, still working today. Yeah, I felt sorry about his house already on fire back in 2008. Yeah. That was a very tragic uh, thing that happened, but luckily he survived. And I'm, I'm glad everybody is doing okay. You know, I, I hope everything will go out for the better. But I'm just happy that this movie became, as we speak, a huge hit at the box office and definitely the best movie ever. And I'm just glad I, I watched this many times. Never get tired of it. I would watch it over and over and over and over again. <laughs> so anyway, that's Back to the Future, and I give that film five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabara, and stay tuned for all the other sequels that's going to follow later on, so I'm going to get to that, and <laughs> I'll see you later. Bye.